Thank you for listening to a Sunday morning sermon from First Christian Church. For more information about these sermons or FCC in general, visit us online at FCCFlora.com. Over the last few weeks, we've been going through this series entitled Unshaken. It's Paul's letter to the early church. And as he's been writing to the church, he's been seeking to encourage and to help them grow and to prosper in their faith. And so as we sing these songs, if I want to see a victory, it's the same victory that they were celebrating then, the same victory that gave them strength and encouragement and provided a way. But for them, it was just every day was that same thing. It just, how are we going to endure? How are we going to face what's ahead of us? And so for us this morning, as we take this in, as we've been going through this, may we too celebrate in the victory of our Lord and Jesus. And that we would find confidence and strength in that. So our whole series is how can we as believers of today find the strength it takes to stand in this dangerous time that we live in. The opposition the church is going to face each day. And so last week we opened up the first part of chapter 3. As we noticed in that first part, it's just that you were born for this, but if you're accepting of Jesus, you're going to face opposition that you know by accepting this, you are going to have this hit out on you. That, that Satan is going to come after you for you declaring the name of Jesus. And by that declaration, but we stand and withstand in that as well together. Will we go through this process today as we open the word of prayer? Heavenly Father, would you thank us for uh, continued guidance as we go through this, we share together? that we would continue to help guide and to help lead each day. But God, but your calling and your will and your leading that, Lord, that we would understand that each day is another step, another progress, another way that we wouldn't just stop, we wouldn't go back, but we would continue to, to lean in, to trust you, Lord, to find strength and a confidence of, of you and knowing you in the power and equipping that you give us as we share together. And so, Lord, as we want to, just lean into you today. Posture ourselves as we would live as if you were returning today. We thank you, Lord. And in your name we pray, amen. If you want to turn to chapter three, it's where we're going to pick up this morning. To, on the way to get there, let's kind of fill you in on what's taking place. Here. Now, Paul, a lot of times in his letter, he, he writes about these things that are going on in his world. He talks about his transformation. He talks about the moment where he encountered God in such a real way on that road that one day. As the light shined in his transformation, he turned away from his life and turned to a life of Christ. This born again moment. And then we see often reference to when Christ returned on that day when Christ comes back. Now, how many of you are really good at waiting? Good, good participation, guys. I figured I could get you all to participate on that one. No one would respond, right? So, but we're like that, right? When you go to a dark point, when you're like, I've been here for a half hour. What's taking so long? Why, I had an appointment, Right? Or where's my food? Things like that, where we are like, I've been waiting. We're not great at waiting. But what we see here from Paul is Paul's writing to them about the beginning when he encountered Christ, and that life changing moment took place. And then he's talking to them about Christ's return. Now, here's the thing that what he's writing to the church about and their role is there's a large gap here between the two. And while you're waiting, this is the gap we are called to fill. Through our life and faith and the church and its responsibility to go and to reproduce and disciple, to grow and to encourage. So here you are. In the meanwhile, while you're waiting, why don't you keep busy, right? We see this with our kids a lot. Hey, we've got to wait here. Why don't you color on this napkin? Do something to distract your mind. Well, here he's saying, while you're waiting in anticipation of Christ's return, why don't we do something? Why don't we go out? Why don't you continue to grow and to build, to glorify the kingdom? And so as he's going through this, he says, be prepared for these trials. Understand this, as we saw in the first part. Understanding your purpose, our purpose in accepting Christ is to go and to advance the kingdom. Well, by our purpose, now we gain power because we understand the opposition. We understand what's coming after us. And so as he's writing to them and he's writing to us today, may we share in that, that we understand what is ahead of us. But last week we saw that we were born for this. This week we look at, we're ready for this. That if we understand what's ahead of us, we can't be surprised by it. Being prepared. And so as Paul's writing, he's like, because you're ready for this. You're ready to face these obstacles. It's just us stepping into Christ. If you see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, you're starting in verse 6. We can, I'll read it aloud for you. You can follow in your Bible or on the screen or your device, whatever's most comfortable for you. 
We invite for a place where you can take notes and to share. We see here, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now, we really live. Since you are standing firm in the Lord, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again. Supply what is lacking in our faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May you strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Through Paul's words, we begin to see a little bit of a characteristic about himself. Now understand here, remember Paul's letter to this church, he was open up and, and he was talking. Now at the beginning of the letter, he used a lot of the, the standard paraphrasing, the characteristics of this is what a letter to the church should look like. And he used a lot of his other letters. But as Paul gets deeper into this letter, he begins to open up and he begins to show his true nature, his love that he has for them. And he, he veers away from just the standard letter to this is a personal letter and this is my heart. Now, Paul shows a little bit about himself here. One of the characteristics we see about Paul as he opens up here is Paul's kind of tough as nails, right? He, he's tough in his endurance here. He's like, you got this, you can do this. I've been there, I've been through the Lord continues to lead me. You're good. And then he shows another nature of his spirit and that's his compassionate nature. I was so worried about you. I missed you. I, I wanted to be with you. Are you okay? See, he begins to show this double side. Most times in our life when people say, well, they're just a really noble in character or they, they're honest or they're trustworthy or they're compassionate. Usually someone describes you by one thing, but Paul begins to show him the full nature of himself here, telling him that, by me showing you who I am, I'm letting you in. I'm letting down the walls and we're able to care and to walk together in life. And because of that, he's able to now be at a further encouragement to them as they see this. And so as he goes through this, we see in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. In other words, we need others in our lives who are walking with us, who are sharing with us, but also it's us growing in our faith that helps us realize that others are around us in the way that we can help guide them as well. I once heard it said, and I don't know who said it, I'm sorry, but basically they said the best way to turn a bad day up around is to help someone else make their day better. Sometimes it's taking our attention off our problems and our concerns and pouring someone else will help uplift us and enlighten us. And that's where Paul is as he's opening up in this, this letter here. As we saw today, his compassion here, as he's sharing, he's revealing himself to them. He begins by talking about how big a blessing they were to him. Let's look back at verse seven here. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we, in, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Now, remember, we saw in chapter two, Paul wanted to be there. I wish we could be there. I longed to be there, but Satan kept throwing up these hindrances, these roadblocks. He kept stopping my path back to you. And so often we think, well, Paul's writing this letter. It's not like a postcard. He's not on vacation in Corinth. You know, he's not at the beach. He's not watching the sunset. Hey, hopefully you guys are doing good. Your life is great. But Paul's in the middle of persecution himself. Remember the roadblock that Satan threw at him was the church of Corinth was in mass destruction. It was going chaotic. And so he was there to attend to help them stabilize all that was taking place. And so as he's writing to them, he's kind of getting down on the church. He, he's, his heart's kind of broken. Why is all these happening? Why, if God, see those same questions we ask ourselves. But he says this, I sent Timothy there to check on you guys to make sure you were okay. And the report that Timothy brought back encouraged me and my faith. And my concern for you, you were the one that was uplifting me. That's what happens when we share life together that sometimes in the middle of the chaos, we're able to lift each other up. Now, we begin to see that this carries on a little bit farther here. In verse eight, as he goes, it says, for now we really live since you are standing firm 
in the Lord. Now, the translation of this from the Greek literally translates, I can finally breathe. And you might wonder, like, what? For now we really live or I can finally breathe. What it means by I can finally breathe or I can finally live again is basically this talking, he said, the weight of my worry for you guys has left me breathless, right? When someone you love and you're reaching out and you call them on the phone, they don't answer and you don't get a response, immediately what does your mind do? You worry, right? Parents of teenage drivers, right? No response. I saw that meme on Facebook where it was like, when my teenage student doesn't answer their phone, the first thing I imagine is car wreck, house fire, all these things. You're like, immediately you go to worry and you go to panic and I can't breathe. And what Paul was telling them is that I was worried for you guys. But because of Timothy's report of how well you're doing, the weight was lifted and I can finally breathe again. The encouragement that you've been to me is bringing life back into me to share together in this. Rick Warren talks about the importance of what it means for us to share together. And he says, humility is this, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Humility is seeking to think of others first. Culture, sometimes we, we want to look and examine my own issues and my own problems, but really as we're walking together, we can help others and to be encouragement to share. And what he reminds of is that accepting Christ is, is that very nature. Less me, more him. John 3.30. He must become greater, I must become less. And the nature in which we, we walk and we share. And so as Rick Warren writes in those moments, he's letting us, sometimes it's just changing the focus from us to him and to others. That way we're not stuck in our own issues, our own problems, but rather to realize that all that we've needed has been given to us in advance. Now, last week, if you were with us, you, we witnessed Leonard being baptized and with the celebration that we shared and, and a lost one coming home. But we also understand baptism is not his end. Baptism is his beginning. And sometimes we get that backwards in our goal. And here's the thing that we need to realize is so often in nature, we say these things to ourselves as God calls us into places and situations. I just didn't know what to say. What am I supposed to do? And see, Satan begins to tell you that you don't know enough, or you're not good enough, or you're not worthy enough. But our baptism says something different. If you would, if you'd grab your glow stick, please do not break it. This is not that time. Just look at it. Just look at it. But I want you to look at this and examine it with me. Here, what you begin to see is you see this little capsule. And that is a lot like us. On our own, we're kind of just nothing. But what Christ says is, as we go through this process, he says, you're a lot like this. But when we come to baptism, in the receiving of Christ on that day, the Holy Spirit fills us. And on that day, you are given an empowerment to do all the things that you didn't think you can do. I don't have the words to say, he can say them. I don't know what to, he'll lead us in the way that we need to go. But so often we examine our life. And so this is that reminder, that sign that God has given us everything we need. It's inside of us. Don't do it yet. Because you're tempted, just like children, it's okay. Because I'm tempted too, but wait till the end. But just like this, for it to work, even though you possess everything that you need, you contain it all inside of you, faith has to be activated. You can possess it, you can have it, you can contain it, but you have to activate it. And sometimes we view life and, and our walk a lot like the Dance Dance Revolution machine. Now, first service had no clue what I was talking about. So I don't know if anybody in this room has ever been to an arcade with a Dance Dance Revolution. Nobody? Anybody? Okay. So you know what I'm talking about, right? It's the nine squares and basically you got two people right here and it's kind of a dance off, right? And on the screen, it plays a song and it has arrows and basically it's like forward, back, side, side, flip, flip. I know, I've got talent. All right. You're impressed. For Wyatt, I've got a little rhythm. Okay. But... But what we begin to see here is sometimes we view faith just like that. 
in, out, sin, faithful. Boom. Good step, right? And we're going to do it again each day, right? I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. See, and that's where we feel like we're worthy. That's us saying, God, I'm, I'm, I'm good. No, uh, uh. See, that's not how God views it. We do it because we're like, oh, I sinned. Oh, I'm good. But what he says, he says, are you tempted to be all in? Or are you all out? See, God doesn't see the dance. He sees those who are seeking to follow him with all they have, taking what he's given you and activating it, living out the calling that he has for the church, that you and I would take that and use it. And we see here, verse 12, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. And as he's letting us know that we should see progress in our faith, if our faith has been activated, if we've set it into motion, we're taking steps of progress. So remember back in chapter one, when Paul was writing, he said, the church, you guys have done so well, all threads, I couldn't find anyone that has not heard about the gospel because of you. He says, what you were given was to bless others. And that's exactly what you did. When your faith was activated, when your light was shining, nothing could hold you back. Nothing could stop you from what you're doing because you were ready for that. And the opposition you face, you're still glorifying God because of it, because of the strength that was given to you. And he says, it may continue to increase in us. And whether we're chosen to do a little or a lot, it's taking what we've been given each day. He says, your faith has grown daily. We see in chapter four of Proverbs, verse 16, it says, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow each other for everyone else, just as ours does for you. And what we begin to see is baptism is just that beginning step. It says, go to the end. Don't stop. Our goal is not complete. May our love grow bigger. May our love grow brighter. May our love grow stronger. Will we keep the fight on to advance the kingdom and the gospel? See, faith activated sees progress, sees steps. We see in verse 13 of chapter three, it says, may he strengthen your hearts so that we will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. As we go there where our hearts continue to grow, where we strengthen, we find ourselves, we find our nature and we see that what he's calling us to here is that we would grow and produce a faith that is alive is continuing to go and to continue to build. I told a story last week at the end of where I was talking about Luke and I and uh, Lincoln, we were, we were carving pumpkins. This year, Lincoln, or Luke got this really cool idea that he said, I, I want to cook the seeds. Someone told him about it. We got to do it. So not only did we carve the pumpkins, but then we spent time cleaning the seeds. That took a process in itself. I made him do that. So that way he earned it. Uh, but then we had to go through the process of drying. And so it was a couple of days letting them dry and going through. And then finally we got to cook them, all the anticipation of them cooking. We bring them out of the oven, we let them cool. He puts one seed in his mouth, goes, Ugh. <laughs> all of that for an Ugh. But then it reminded me as I'm, I'm looking at that one seed, see that one seed create a vine. That one vine probably produced several pumpkins. And each one of those pumpkins has hundreds of seeds in it. And they take those seeds and plant new vines, new pumpkins, hundreds of seeds. See, the purpose of a seed is to reproduce. And Christ has planted you as his seed to bear fruit, to plant more seeds, to plant more fruit. The purpose of a seed is to reproduce, to grow. And that's what God is calling us in today. That we would share in our abundance as we see in verse 10, as we prepare to close here. If the band wants to join me back up here, that'd be great. Verse 10, it says, night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. What well, we begin to see here in the term, what is lacking from your faith, that you would grow in strength, would you grow in your encouragement, would you find your ability? In another translation, it says that you would be perfected. 
Imperfect we see in times of the Bible and scripture that it talks about the nets that they would go out and they would cast to catch the fish. And in the morning as they would come back, they would tend to their nets and they would go in to patch the holes. And as they'd go to patch the holes, they would go in to, to secure them, to tighten them up because that is where the fish were escaping. Their catch was leaving what they were doing. And for us as the body, as we shared together, we need to realize that sometimes in our own faith, we got to perfect things. We, we got to close the gaps where we have a hole, where things are leaking out. Because for us, we see the gap. Right now for the gap of the church is in the meanwhile, in the waiting as we wait for Christ's return, that we continue to go to do and to secure in obedience and following of Christ as we share together. So one more time, I want you to grab your glow stick and not yet. I'm testing you on that waiting part I said at the beginning, I know. But here's the thing. I'm a very visual person and I need that illustration sometimes. But when it's time, when we stand and we, we begin to sing, when you're ready, that's when I want you to activate your stick. That's your declaration to God. Say, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to activate. I'm ready to be all in. But here's the thing, like some of you who are probably holding yours strategically because something like this happened. Some of you probably have a little glow already taking place. But the thing is, though, as you're holding, you probably did something like this. I'm good. <laughs> Maybe more than a few of you. Okay. But that's the very thing that we want to illustrate. <laughs> Because when you stepped into Christ and your light came on when Christ filled you and then opposition came, you're like, look, Satan, no, I'm good. I'm going to turn that off. As I said, when we come into Christ, we're all in. You can't hide what he's put inside of you. We can try. But just like this, as you notice, for those of you who've cracked yours early, you can't turn it off. And that's the way we were meant to be. When we accepted Christ, when we stepped forward in faith, when our light was shining, not to be hid, but to shine bright. And so as you stand and as you sing in just a moment, I want you to crack them. Let that light shine. And while this is gonna go out tomorrow, realize what's inside of us will never go out. We'll never run out because we were meant to shine in the light and the love of God because we are ready for this. So the gifting he's given inside of you. So if you would, would you please stand with us? And as we sing, it's now the time when you're ready.